this is sort of a 30,000 foot overview of these topics. I, you know, I, I sort of wanted to take sort of the approach of common questions that I would say clinicians um, and other folks get asked um, uh, related to the use of cannabis, in particular, the risks of cannabis use, although you have to temper that with the fact that cannabis does have a safe use, just like alcohol, um, but it certainly is associated with some risks. And in particular, we think it's more associated with psychosis than some other drugs. We're still not sure why, but I'll tell you sort of what makes us think that. And then because I want us to sort of think a little bit about how people tend to buy and use it, we'll talk a little bit about uh, THC and CBD, the two main psychoactive components, and just how people tend to use cannabis products, and especially uh, in states where it's been legalized, where dispensaries have become quite prominent. Um, so these are the learning objectives. I'll sort of let you read them briefly. These are the sort of three main topics that we'll go over. Again, these are common questions, I would say, that clinicians get asked, at least clinicians in our programs. So this is just a quick overview. Many of you may already know this, but just so we're using the same language. Um, so uh, I, I mentioned this before, but uh, tetrahydrocannabidiol, uh, uh, THC, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, blunder the longer names. THC is what's responsible for the high of cannabis. So when people say they're smoking cannabis or marijuana to get high, largely the THC compounds are what are responsible for this sort of intoxication effect. Again, what people like about it and then what can become problematic um, in terms of clinical intoxication. Um, and it is a dose dependent effect THC. So we'll talk a bit about um, dosing of THC in particular in edibles and uh, dabbing uh, where the, the doses can become quite high. Um, cannabidiol, I think, is probably in the news now. Most people have heard about it. Um, you know, it, it, it gets sort of placed in that category of wonder drugs sometimes. I think what you can say about cannabidiol is that it has very little psychoactive effect. So it's not what, it's not what is making people, quote unquote, high when they're using cannabis or marijuana. It doesn't seem to have intoxication doses. So it doesn't seem like if you ingest a lot of cannabidiol that you could have a problematic, you know, anxious episode or panic attack or anything like that or paranoia. Um, and then I hesitate to say this, but there's, there's some okay evidence that it may balance the THC negative effects. So some of the negative effects that we may talk about seem to be attributable to THC. It's possible that CBD may in some way limit them or ameliorate them. Although the caveat here is the dosing can be tricky to pull off and to measure. Um, so I just wanted to talk about the sort of common uses. Um, so most people, when I say marijuana, most people are thinking about the plant or the bud form. This is certainly still the most common form by far. Um, and it's uh, in the US, most of the strains are derived from these so-called skunk strains, which are in general high THC strains. Um, so just to be aware, if you sort of tracked um, THC levels in cannabis over time, what you would find is even though cannabis use sort of peaked in the 1970s in terms of number of people who say that they had tried it, um, it was actually fairly weak uh, in terms of the cannabis that we can purchase now. Um, and this trend has only continued. Um, and so um, I'll sort of point out two sort of markers here. One is that in some studies that try to look at high potency versus low potency cannabis, they will use a 10% cutoff. So the value of that cutoff is that most cannabis that you would purchase in the US meets the high potency threshold, just so we know that. That's not true in Europe where there are lower potency versions of cannabis that people use like hashish and other things. But in the US, we're generally talking about if people smoke cannabis, they're generally using what we call high potency cannabis. Um, and this trend has uh, you know, only continued over the last 10 years and probably um, depending on the dispensary and the branding and things, probably if you go to a dispensary now, you're going to get, you, you'll be easily able to get 15 to maybe even up to 25% THC content cannabis, although 25% may still be relatively rare. Um, so uh, people will, edibles have become much more common now that cannabis has been legalized and there's sort of a market for it. This, I think this part of the market has boomed. So just, just to remind us what, what we can do, there's a processing where you can create sort of a butter or a syrup. Uh, from the marijuana plant. And then you can use that in a baked good, i.e. a brownie or a candy. And I think gummies are probably becoming one of the more common ways that people use uh, the candy version of cannabis. Um, things to note because they, we think it's related to some uh, accidental overdoses is that um, this form has a much slower onset of action than if people inhale cannabis. So I think people may actually use more than they quote unquote needed to use because they don't wait long enough for the effect. 
Um, so there's, there's some data to suggest that um, ED visits are, have gone up more for uh, edibles than they have for inhalable cannabis for that reason. Um, vaping is becoming more and more common. This is also for nicotine, of course. It's becoming more, it's kind of, nicotine is, in young people, nicotine is basic, nicotine vaping has replaced cigarettes as the most common form of tobacco. Um, and that, and I think that trend is at least on its way to happening for THC. I don't know if I would completely replace it. Um, uh, one thing that I'll mention is that the, the, you got to be careful, the, the math with this, you have to keep track of because people, people aren't necessarily keeping track of how much they're inhaling because you can inhale it rather quickly which is harder to do with the plant form because there's a particulate smoke that you're inhaling. So there's sort of a natural sort of um, break on how quickly you can ingest the smoking. It, that's not so much of a break on the vapes. Um, and just because uh, these are still relatively uncommon, these are, these are probably, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, cannabis experts or folks who folks who are in, in, enmeshed in the in the culture of enmeshed is not the right word who are, who who know a lot about the culture of cannabis. Uh, but dabs, resins, extracts. So there, there are these sort of I'm just going to call them globally paste forms um, that can be lit and you can capture the vapors. That's one way that you could. Uh, um, ingest them, or you could apply them and absorb them. Although the absorption will probably vary a lot by the product and where you try to absorb it, like a chapstick, for example. These tend to be very high THC, so they're designed to be uh, extremely potent forms of cannabis ingestion. Um, so I, just to summarize, um, so, so the plant or bud form is the most common. It's certainly easy to get. We'll touch on that again. Um, and its potency has consistently grown. And in the US, most plant or bud form will be high potency. Um, edibles, I just want to mention this again, probably one of the issues with edibles is that uh, because um, they're absorbed through the stomach and the intestine, it's a little unpredictable how fast the high is going to happen. So sometimes people will accidentally uh, uh, use a larger amount than they would have intended if they were smoking. Um, uh, vaping, like I mentioned, I think it's, it's easier to ingest THC quickly. So that's, that's probably the main difference between vaping and smoking the plant. Um, and then I, this is when I have conversations with people about how much they're using, vapes make the math a little bit more difficult um, because you have to be keeping track of how long it takes you to go through a cartridge. Most people more keep track of how many times they inhale or how many times they took a hit, which is, a little, or, and, and with the plant form, it's a little bit easier to measure how many joints or how fast you went through a gram. With the vapes, I find you just have to, you have to really do the math on the milligrams per milliliter in the vape itself. Um, and then dabs or waxes, even though they're relatively uncommon, they have probably the highest THC content on average of any cannabis product. Um, so I, this, this is a Healthy Kids survey from about five uh, uh, to 10 years ago. I, I think it, um, one thing I found, because I, I was curious about this, actually cannabis use rates uh, haven't gone up that much in the past 10 years. Actually, the, the largest increase was in the sort of 2000s and the early 2010s. Um, and so you might say that legalization was driven by increased use uh, or the sort of uh, the culture accepting use as opposed to increased use being driven by legalization. Um, what this is just showing is that uh, uh, cannabis is, it, the take home point here is cannabis is pretty easy to get for young people. Um, so, uh, in fact, the vast majority of people who are juniors in high school would say it's uh, pretty easy to get. Um, and then you might get up to a quarter of uh, high schoolers saying that they use it heavily, which usually means several times per week or more. Um, and then, of course, you can see the one or more times in the past year. The one or more times in the past year is roughly equivalent to alcohol. So uh, young folks are using cannabis now almost as much as they use alcohol. Um, there is some variation by school district. Um, so I just bring this up because it's good to know, it's, it's good to know maybe your local data so that California will give you local data. I just wanted to show that this is not to call out Mendocino County. It's just to show that the Bay Area counties actually, actually aren't too far off of the California mean, but there are some counties like Mendocino where if you ask high schoolers, they'll say, yeah, more than half of them will say that they have used cannabis. So just, just so it's, it's good to be aware of sort of the general data in your own county because the use actually varies a fair bit by county. Now this is self-report, so it's people, you can imagine also people are more comfortable saying that they used on a questionnaire. That may be a, a difference in these kinds of surveys. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about use. Um, so you know, it's, it's a relatively safe drug in small amounts. Um, its potency is increasing um, and, and young people find it easy to get. Um, and so the question then becomes, what are the risks? Um, and so we've known for a long time that there's an association between cannabis. And in this case, we're, we're 
uh, looking at schizophrenia. So, uh, so this would be a specific outcome, a specific syndrome outcome. Um, but this was a study actually, the, the power of this study is it actually wasn't actually interested in cannabis per se. It was just uh, one of those studies where nurses would come and interview families over time. Um, and, and what they found was just, it, this wasn't an expected finding. They just found that if you were a young person who used cannabis more than 50 times before the age of 16, and I followed you for 10 years, you had a much higher rate of developing schizophrenia 10 years later than uh, somebody who didn't use cannabis. And it was a dose dependent effect. So it seemed to be somewhat increased for people who used it a little bit, and then significantly increased for people who used it a lot. Just that doesn't prove causality. We can't prove that the cannabis caused the schizophrenia. Um, but what we what we can say is that there's an association, and this association is more powerful than than the association, for example, between alcohol and schizophrenia, uh, which would be sort of another commonly used drug. Um, and so I. I want to just, so, so more data that there's some reason to be concerned. There's some association. In Europe now, uh, they, because it's a little bit easier to study cannabis in Europe because it's not, um, um, it's not federally illegal in a lot of places, or at least it's easier for scientists to study it. Um, this, what this is just showing, just want you to focus on how the curves, the two different colored curves in each of these graphs pretty much map onto each other. This is just showing that, um, if you go around Europe, what you find is that there's a, there's a correlation, there's an association between how many people develop psychosis and whether, and how many people are using cannabis daily or how many people are using high potency cannabis. Um, so, so again, this, this idea that there's a, vul there's a vulnerable population, we don't know who they are ahead of time. It's not most people, but there's a vulnerable population where you see an association between heavy cannabis use. But I just wanna remind us, because when, when we talk to young people, we, we have to be sort of honest about what the data is. It, what you can say is that if you use it uh, uncommonly, so in this case, the studies would say weekly use or less, there's no detectable risk. So the risks of cannabis, it, with the association between cannabis and psychosis, I shouldn't say the cause, the association comes out, uh, you only find it for heavy use or daily use. You don't find it for weekly use or, or just on weekends, for example. I, I mentioned this because I think this is another issue. So, so the, the risk of cannabis and schizophrenia seems to be daily use over a long period of time. But of course, THC, just like alcohol, if people use too much of it, you can have bad outcomes that you would call uh, clinical intoxications. Um, and so in Colorado, there was an emergency room. So Colorado actually legalized cannabis way back in 2012. Um, and so for the first five years of that legalization, uh, there was an academic hospital in Colorado that just said, let's look at, is there any change in cannabis attributable visits that we could find over time? I um, mean, what they found is it wasn't surprising to them that the visits went up. So there was an increase in people going to the emergency room for cannabis intoxication after legalization. I think they expected that. Um, but what, what, they, what they found was that if you looked at whether the people came because they had used inhaled cannabis or because they had used um, uh, in, uh, edibles, um, they, they, there's sort of two points here. One is that there's a syndrome called hyperemesis syndrome. I just want people to be aware of it because it's not something that I think was common or commonly thought of before people used very high doses of cannabis over very long periods of time because cannabis actually usually makes people less nauseated. Um, and so what we think is happening is that if you use a lot of cannabis, it actually ends up having the opposite effect, the way your body adapts to it. And so I just want people to be aware that there's a syndrome called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome that is one potential outcome of very high uses of THC. Um, but the other finding uh, that I think is relevant to talking about edibles is that um, consistent with this idea of accidental overdose, if people were going to go to the uh, emergency room for something that was behavioral, so they were confused, they were paranoid, or they had a panic attack, that's cardiovascular symptoms there, or chest pain, it was much more likely to be edible. Um, and so, in fact, an edible, even though edibles are rarely used, they accounted for a significant proportion of ED visits. So the idea here is that um, THC has sort of two risks. One is if you use it every day over long periods of time, that's the more associated with psychosis risk. And then there's the THC intoxication risk, which is the amount of, uh, which is ingesting too much THC at a single point in time. And the edibles and probably dabbing and waxing are where you see some of those poor outcomes. Um, 
So I, I said this, but you can see that even though edibles are only a small percentage of total cannabis sales, they were 10% of ED visits. So a very large uh, rate of probably, probably accidental overdose with edibles. Um, so uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit just because I think the cannabidiol story, I, when I talk to young people now, I think most people have heard about cannabidiol and most people have been told that it's relatively safe, which is true. Um, and so I just want to I just want us to walk through sort of the cannabidiol story as it relates to um, the FDA and sort of um, drugs that are now available to be prescribed in the United States. Um, so I think so a question that often gets asked is, you know, is CBD going to be something that we could use over the counter or something that people could try out? And the answer is sort of, well, it is available now, but it's kind of sort of available in this very specific restricted um, approval process. So I just wanted to let people know sort of because there's this tension between cannabis being illegal at the federal level, um, but largely legal at the state level in a lot of different states. Um, and so there is this process called this uh, drug called Epidiolex, which has been FDA approved now for several years for the treatment of infantile seizures. These are these are a rare type of infantile seizure. Um, and um, this is actually the first natural cannabis program, uh, product. So, so I think people who are interested in cannabis being more studied, they found this as hopeful. Um, there are there are um, marijuana sort of uh, synthetic marijuana derivatives that are used in medicine, but this is something where this this product was made from actual cannabis plant and distilled down, and the CBD was separated out. Um, the caveat here, though, is that um, because THC and CBD occur naturally, for this product to be approved, the um, pharmaceutical company had to demonstrate that they had gotten 99.9% .9 of the THC out of the cannabis. So it's essentially pure cannabidiol. That's difficult to do because these, um, the, most cannabis plants have CBD and THC in high levels of both of them. So I'm gonna come back to that because it relates to how cannabidiol when it's sold as a helpful product, the practicalities of buying it from a dispensary are that you can't get anywhere near this level of separation out of THC or CBD. Um, but interestingly, the FDA did put uh, cannabidiol into what's called Schedule 5. Now, this is the super purified cannabidiol that's an Epidiolex. Um, schedule 5 is sort of where we have things like children's aspirin. So, 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 the, the, it, it, so in, in, in some sense, this is the FDA saying that CBD is very safe, and that would be consistent with all the studies we have to date on cannabidiol. It doesn't seem to be a harmful drug for most people. And I'm using this because I think because of that fact, you'll see a lot of products that are kind of, you know, you might call these, you know, uh, something you might buy, buy at Walgreens if it, if it didn't have THC in it, right? There may be some kind of, so it's, it's used in the same way that we, you would see a lot of over-the-counter drugs used, like in these products that help for sort of everyday issues like muscle soreness or PMS or, uh, or um, a rash or something like that. So I, I mentioned this, so Schedule 5 is where children's Tylenol is. So the FDA does say that, you know, this cannabidiol is a safe drug. Although there's still this tension that exists that even though the FDA puts cannabidiol as a Schedule 5 drug, cannabis is still federally illegal and it's what's called a Schedule 1 drug. So I, I, I make sort of, sort of a silly analogy here, which is, you know, for a Schedule 5 drug, most people consider it safe. So most people would never say that good parents don't use children's Tylenol. You wouldn't say that. You would say that that's a safe drug, but you do still hear people say this, right? So, so there's this idea um, uh, at the federal level still, there's a lot of controversy. Here. There's this idea that, that cannabis itself should remain illegal. And so it puts cannabidiol in this weird kind of legal limbo where the only approved product is extremely purified in a way that only a very sort of um, you know, a uh, high profile pharmaceutical company with a lot of resources could purify to that extent. Um, so just to put a quote to it, um, you know, even though CBD is technically legal now, basically any other form of CBD that you could get that's not Epidiolex is going to remain a Schedule One drug. So it's going to carry the same consequences as heroin or LSD in terms of the legal implications. Um, so just keep that in mind. This is at the federal level, of course, in states like California, where cannabis is sort of half legal, whether the feds would intervene is another question, maybe not. Um, and then a final note, because I get this question a lot from young people and families is, you know, well, could I buy this CBD, is a harm reduction, could I buy a CBD product 
at a dispensary and try to replace the high THC product with a high CBD product. That's not a bad idea. That, that would have some evidence behind it. But I just want us to do some math that makes me hesitant about recommending it as a general rule. And that is that if you look at the way that the drug is used in medicine in terms of its FDA approval, it's used in doses of hundreds of milligrams. So an, av an average dose of a drug of cannabidiol for a therapeutic effect would be well into the hundreds of milligrams, sometimes even into 500 or 1,000 milligrams. Um, even higher, I think, sometimes. Um, but that's, that is with a 99.9% .9 purification process where almost all of the THC has been removed. The typical CBD, high CBD product that you're going to buy in a dispensary is actually going to be closer to one to one, maybe two to one or three to one or four to one. Um, and so just, just think about the numbers here. If a therapeutic dose of cannabidiol is 100 milligrams, and I try to go to a dispensary and buy a product that has 100 milligrams of CBD, it's actually going to probably have something like 25 to 100 milligrams of THC, which is for many people an intoxication dose of THC. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, uh, so, so the practical use of cannabidiol uh, in, in terms of the way you might use over-the-counter drugs is probably far away from us because the THC can't be purified to that point. Um, so these are my conclusions. I wanted to make sure I left some time for questions. I did, good. Um, so just a reminder that cannabis products are easy to attain. They're becoming slowly more potent. That's been a trend over the past 30 years. Um, it is a relatively safe drug in moderation. So you have, to, you have to sort of realize that fact. So, which makes it different than things like heroin or methamphetamine, which can have bad outcomes in small amounts. Uh, cannabis doesn't seem to have bad outcomes in small amounts. Um, but it's the daily use during adolescence that we think is a particular risk. Um, um, and then this hyperemesis syndrome, I want us all to be aware of and just be on the lookout for because it's kind of a new syndrome in terms of, the, uh, terms of being described that people didn't think of before. Um, and then maybe driven by edibles and um, waxes, uh, severe cannabis intoxication is probably becoming more common, at least in, as far as the emergency room data that we have. So that's another separate risk. And then CBD is quite safe. So can I, so ev everybody who says that is telling you the truth. They're, they're, not, um, uh, they're not sort of have, having rose colored glasses, but it's just very difficult to chemically separate from THC. So that's the limits at use, its utility until more can cannabidiol products are, uh, more purified cannabidiol products are available. Right. So I'll, I'll end there.